Good evening and welcome to our departmental colloquium. This is the ninth colloquium we've had at CRC. Um, it is a privilege to be doing this live again after so long. The last one I did in person was in 2018. My wonderful colleague Beth got to do the 2019 and then 2020, 2021 were virtual. So I'm very pleased that we're actually able to, to do this. Um, tonight you have two presentations, one by Hayat Batan and one by Gabriela Violet, uh, after which point I'll be talking about our upcoming journal and then as well talking about who's going where next year, which I think is probably the most exciting part of, of our career, seeing where you guys are going after you leave us. Uh, some general announcements about what's coming up next year and uh, that'll be our evening. But before we get started, I have to thank a bunch of people. Uh, first and foremost, my, my wonderful, amazing colleague, Beth, who I could not do this without Beth. There's just no way I could do what I do. And you students who are here are so lucky that you have her as part of, of your instructional ed and educational path. She's just amazing. Uh, the joke that we, what we say about each other is, I do things she won't do, she does things I can't do and you are better served for it. So thank you very, very much for being here tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, some, some colleagues who, who've shown up tonight. It's always great to have you guys in the room. James Frizee in the back, psychology. Amanda Paskey, anthropology. Uh, it is great to have you guys here. Uh, Alex Peshkoff, where are you? There you are, history. Um, and um, it, it's great when you guys come and support our students. Uh, we, we value your participation and your involvement in, in what they do. Uh, the two gentlemen at the door, Gavin Scott and Jimmy Guzman, uh, are doormen tonight. Thank you guys for helping me out. And of course, uh, Jim Lovett behind the camera, who, without whom none of these things get recorded uh, and put on our departmental website. And a little bit about Jim. Jim and I started this, this crazy journey years and years ago, and it's amazing that uh, we're still doing this and that everything that you see on our website has his, his hand, his touch, his counsel. So it's really great to be working with him again in person as opposed to text messages, emails, and, and such. So that said, I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome Gabriela's family. It's great when family gets involved and supports um, daughters and, grand, and granddaughters and, and such. It's amazing that you're, that you're here. Um, having gone through this myself, you know, we talk about what we do, what we study, what we read at school, and your parents kind of like, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. But to actually see it in, in practice, I think, is a, is, is a very important thing. So thank you, thank you all for, for coming. Okay, the first presentation we're going to have is uh, Hayat's, and it's on political psychology. And what her presentation intends to do is to dissect behavior by looking at ego, evaluating social cultural context by way of psychological frameworks, and the theories that relate to behavior in the systemic processes of war and peace. Her two examples are uh, the Yugoslav and the Vietnam Wars. Our second presentation tonight is Gabriella's. Oops, sorry. Uh, our second pr presentation is Gabriella's, and it is on repa repatriation of artwork. And her con her concentration will be examining the historical context of repatriation under international law. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Hayat and uh, ask you to welcome her with a round of applause. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hayat Botan. I'm a freshman here at CRC studying international relations and statistics. I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank our writers and editors of this year's journal. I appreciate all the efforts you've put in the past couple of months. And of course, I'd like to thank Professor Morales for this amazing opportunity of believing in me throughout the process. So my presentation this evening is on political psychology. And when we think of political psychology, the first things that come to mind are voter behavior, how the media has influenced voter behavior, and even the policy motivations of leaders in this country. But studying international relations, the two events that have been analyzed to a great extent have been war and peace, two events that have existed since the beginning of time. What you'll see from this presentation is that a lot of the roots of conflict and war reemerge during peace efforts as what we call universal threats to peace, explaining why we haven't seen sustained peace since the beginning of time. And all of this explains the title for both my article and my presentation. Both the processes of war and peace are interweaving as they both have shared elements that contribute to its outbreak and um, ultimately its success. 
here is a quick overview of what my of what my presentation entails. I will start off by defining political psychology and providing the psychological subfields I have used to devise my to formulate my research. I will then introduce um, my case studies, two wars that have provided distinct stories and circumstances that allow me to draw on the nature of political relations and how psychological findings have been applied to them. And with this, I'd like to emphasize the importance of history. Both history and international relations are inextricably linked. And because history guides us through the complexities of the past, we can now speak openly um, of both the past and the present and apply crucial fields such as psychology um, to both the past and, today's and to today's relations. Following this, I will finally delve into the roots of conflict and war and touch on concepts such as identity, nationalism, victim mentality and entitlement, and the ego. In what sort of seems like a break in, or gap in what many people expected with this presentation, I will briefly discuss the psychological tactics of warfare that have made the wars that I will discuss even more complicated and delicate, considering how much suffering these tactics have inflicted. And the last section with great substantive material is exploring how peace and is exploring peace efforts after war, particularly with a psychological lens. So what is political psychology? Political psychology is what it sounds like. It is emerging of both politics and psychology to study the political behaviors of individuals. This interdisciplinary field um, provides a basic insight and surface level understanding of psychology, using it to analyze the political arena, in, in my case, throughout the processes of war and peace. So every political outcome begins with a psychological impulse. However, it would be misleading to say that every political move is driven by a psychological motive because then every, or a genocidal wrongdoing, for example, would be attributed to a psychological shortcoming. What I mean by all of this is that psychology cannot solely change the political atmosphere to historically challenge and passionate states, nor can it fully dictate the complex environments that we're currently in. It is rather the international institutions, complex environments, and psychological influences that have contributed to a state of historical peril and ceaseless attempts to establish conclusive peace. When institutions fail and environments change to accommodate the international state of affairs, what we see is that the brain has been um, really the sole dependable instrument to analyze human motivation and behaviors through it all. Um, which is why I think psychology is so fitting to both politics and international relations. Um, here on the screen we have the psychological subfields I have used. The main subfield I've used is social psychology. Um, by nature we're composed of instinctual drives and are constantly surrounded by individuals who ultimately help influence the decisions of these drives. And really social psychology has been the heart of this discipline. What is sensed throughout my article and presentation is humanistic psychology, as I emphasize the individual and their needs, and even how the state has provided for these needs. Um, things like safety, belonging, and other, and other biological necessities. And I also emphasize moral psychology, as I challenge the morality of war, and ultimately how war has affected human welfare over time. The section where I discuss psychological tactics of warfare, that is entirely and purely militaristic military psychology, things like propaganda through political oratory in the media, along with the use of terror tactics, are some of the elements of military psychology that I explore. And lastly, the human ego and its corresponding theorists who have devised theories surrounding um, or regarding the human ego and motivations, all that falls under psychoanalysis. I will be sure to discuss this subfield and the criticisms it, had, it has been subjected to in recent times. The wars that I used to analyze the intricacies of both war and peace are the Yugoslav Wars of 1989 to 2001 and the Vietnam War of 1955 to 1975. The Yugoslav Wars generally involved the moral failings of leaders, including how personal ambitions such as the pursuit for national independence have transformed into national self-glorification with the presence of mythical heroes who draw on the anxieties and instabilities of war. What we see with the Vietnam War, even as we look back five decades now, are the dangers of ideological conflicts that involve stark cultural divides, and even more so how the miscalculation of cultural importance to a war's operations can, a war's operation can lead to a series of drawbacks that result in power imbalances um, in a country's sources of authority uh, post-war. <coughs> 
Now I'll take you through a brief, a very brief history of both Yugoslavia and Vietnam. The multi-ethnic federation of Yugoslavia was situated in the west central part of the Balkans. Prior to 1918, Yugoslavia was under the control of numerous empires, but as these empires dissolved, um, a single Slav state was established or formed with power mainly being um, shared between ethnic Serbs and Croatians, who were the two strongest nations. We have a couple of key players to take note of, or I should say six republics that were involved in the wars, um, some much more involved than others. We have the wealthy Catholic republics of Slovenia and Croatia, who sought closer relations with Europe, the pure Orthodox Republic of Macedonia, the Central Republic of Montenegro and Serbia, and the Muslim Republic of Bosnia. I think it's also important that I mention that Serbia had two autonomous regions called Kosovo and Vojvodina. So in World War II, um, in World War II, Yugoslavia was decimated, to put it mildly. You see horrible atrocities committed by the Ustash, who were a Croatian military force. And the majority of these atrocities were committed against the Serbs. The Serbs then formed their own military force called the Chetniks, and we eventually see these conflicts between these two um, powers, who are the two strongest nations in Yugoslavia. What emerges during these conflicts are partisan forces led by um, Joseph Tito, who heavily pushed this idea that his forces were the only group who um, pushed for or protected a common Yugoslav identity. Following the war, Tito emerged as the head of state and sought to transform national identities such as Serbian or Croatian into ethnic identity so that the Yugoslav identity would be the national identity of all. He hoped to make Yugoslavia the nation of which or to which all gave primary loyalty and the origin of all national sentiments. And really for as long as Tito was in this position, his promise and his promise for a unified and loyal state was unquestioned. Fast forward to 1980, um, Tito dies in the country's economy nears collapse. And his established rotating presidency provision led to growing nationalism as the, this provision was used as a bargaining tool by many nationalities. With all of this, the desire, desire for autonomy among nationalities grew, particularly in Kosovo, where the Serb minority felt persecuted by, by the Albanian majority. This is when we see individuals like Slobodan Milicevic emerge. Um, he was an ethnic Serb, but he promised to protect persecuted Serbs all throughout Yugoslavia, um, vowing to create an autonomous state for all ethnic Serbs. In 1989, Milicevic gained power in Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Vojvodina. In 1990, the Yugoslav Communist Party dissolves or collapses, and here's when we see a vast number of conflicts that pretty much involves growing nationalist passions, ethnic groups viewing themselves as ethnically superior to one another, establishing what is called um, barbarian images, and pure military, pure military violence and multitude of atrocities. Prior to being colonized, um, the Indian society was influenced by Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, um, all of which served as a centrality of belief and ideology prior to colonization. During the Age of Exploration, um, at some point, France was scrambling to establish, it, establish itself around the world, but eventually it was able to establish um, a colonial holding in, in Vietnam. France radically transformed Vietnamese society, how Vietnamese society was run by changing systems of taxation, um, turning Vietnamese, the Vietnamese economy into an or export-oriented economy, and inst installing Christian missionaries throughout. All this is important because Vietnam's history with colonialism is what ultimately, ultimately makes it easier for Westerners to once again re-engage during its civil war, also known as the um, Vietnam War. Following World War II, the seemingly obvious confrontation between the West and the East led to the Cold War, um, which once again Vietnam found itself geographically bounded by these two sides. The U.S. officially began its involvement in France um, when, it, when it helped um, in assisting France to defend its colonial presence in Vietnam. Um, the French were eventually defeated, however, by a group of communists in 1954, um, and the Geneva Conference in 1954 pretty much established two Vietnams, with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in the north led by Ho Chi Minh, and the non-communist government in the south, later aided by the United States. Um, here's a quick and um, brief over overview of both Vietnam and Yugoslavia. And now we will move on to the roots of conflict and war. So identity is defined as a deeply held sense of who a person is, where he or she fits in the political and social world. 
we could extensively talk about these different types of identity, but the one that matters most to this presentation are ethnic and national identity, the type of identity that presents nationalism. In the most natural sense, identity serves as what differentiates those of a different background, culture, and history. In terms of the wars that I've just discussed, the most obvious and stark difference between identities is the American identity and the Vietnamese identity. And the Vietnam War illustrated the blatant and absolute split between generally the Asians and um, the West. As communism began to be associated with Eastern culture in response to events in Russia and China after World War II, the treatment of Vietnamese civilians shifted from considerate to one characterized by bigotry and intolerance. Furthermore, as the Vietnam War continued with no end in sight, what we see is that a lot of Vietnamese realities did not matter. What mattered were how the appearances of Vietnamese realities would affect American realities. This was a key point in what many psychologists considered as the instinct of race hatred. The racial profiles that allowed for the West's normalization of hatred in a sensitive environment such as war severed all sides its willingness to trust, which all came to hurt psychological operations, um, as I will talk or discuss um, in much greater detail. As for the Yugoslav Wars, the micro-level differences in identity became apparent following the death of Joseph Tito. As religion remained a key factor in the beginning of tensions, political leaders exploited an abundance of nationalist rhetoric, that divisive nationalist rhetoric, that ultimately fueled hatred and mistrust among ethnic groups. Um, additionally, as militaristic nationalism grew, um, the prospect of war became enticing, um, which threatened a state of physical peace. What makes identity a root of conflict is how identities can be politicized and portrayed as competitive forces um, placed against each other. The first psychological concept I like to attach to, this, attach to this is cognitive dissonance, or when individuals create this cushion that eases mental discomfort from carrying different morals, values, and beliefs as a result of situational tension such as war. This concept ties into identity because it allows for individuals, and especially leaders, to to exploit cognitive inconsistencies found in war, which attach identity to a state's culture. And I think it's important to think of what that looks like to have a whole identity attached to um, a state. Uh, moving on to nationalism. Nationalists give their primary loyalty to their perceived nation. In countries where people aren't as nationalistic, generally they generally direct their political loyalty elsewhere, such as to an ethnic group, eventually giving rise to divided spaces or divided political bases within a nation. And even when nationalists dislike their government, they still very much love their nation themselves. Um, and this is mainly because of in-group membership that provides a sense of security and um, loyalty for individuals. So nationalists are a group of people, um, also known as a political identity in-group. It's human nature to feel good about the group that you're a part of. Um, it's also important to have a strong positive attachment um, to whatever group you align yourself with. With these patterns in mind, leaders and governments have used this knowledge to their advantage by rallying large groups of people and provoking passionate feelings of devotion to the nation. In times of war, the dull daily routines that are replaced with fighting for a larger cause, such as the state, um, a lot of that restores the excitement and enthusiasm of one's purpose. And a lot of that um, is done through um, nationalism, as nationalism leads to the politicization of identities and transforms individual identities into um, agentic ones. In war, um, what we see is that nations go back and forth between attacking each other's revered cultures. And this is generally, generally how nationalism finds its way in a conflict, through the very use of hateful and violent rhetoric, later upheld by racist displays in um, entertainment and media. Moving on to victim mentality and entitlement. So victim mentality is a learned behavior as a result of previous hostilities. And over time, when two groups place each other in positions that isolate them from the rest, um, it becomes relatively easy to, to ignore the other party and feed oneself with self-fulfilling prophecies that justify the level of violence um, employed during a war if war uh, materializes. As communication between the two groups dies um, in the course of time, the nation or group falls into what is called or falls into an isolated and oversensitive, oversensitive bubble. It is in this stage where the populace seeks um, information that favors and confirms already existing beliefs, a, con a concept known as confirmation bias, which in a lot of that ultimately 
strengthens a collective unit's cognitive biases and irrational size, styles of thinking. And through it all, a lot of that can potentiate a cause to an ongoing conflict. This hostile cycle of collective victimhood that is seen and um, employed by states, a lot of that is fueled by historical circumstances. And when you come to think of it, history is an ongoing po process. So this mentality is likely to continue um, to be used as tactical advantages and justifications for a war's longevity, but also um, its ruthless disregard for humanity. The repercuss repercussions of self-victimization to avoid responsibility, for example, are seen on the international level. And a lot of that includes dangerous um, efforts to the peacemaking and peacebuilding attempts, something that you will all realize in the peace in psychology section. A lot of the times when, what emerges from this type of mentality is, is the desire to seek revenge, because people often view it as an integral part of seeking justice. Um, However, I'd like to provide the differences between the two because the words justice and revenge can be used interchangeably, but the distinctions between the two are very important, especially to war. Revenge is often emotional, and justice is often rational, at least it is, as it applies to the um, roots of conflict and war. Revenge also involves cycles of retaliation, while justice involves a desire to seek revenge, um, or sorry, the desire to seek um, balance and restore balance. What makes revenge in a victim mentality a root of conflict and war is how connected power motives and one's entitlement for something can stand in the way of um, accountability and can also stand in the way of their ability to see past wars operations led by leaders who also encourage this concept of a collective, vi collective, collective victimhood. Moving on to the ego. So the study of the ego is an integral part um, of the study of psychology. The two concepts that are often and heavily tied to the ego are one's power motive and self-serving bias. Prior to a war, the perfectly rational decision maker is able to detach his or her, sorry, his or her ego from a state's culture. However, this becomes an impossible task, especially with leaders who have overt, overt personal vendettas against a particular group. People like Milicevic, who promoted ethnic hate and created nationalist mobs, a lot of that pointed to his high need for power and self-serving bias, as he was more willing to take responsibility for the successes of his country, um, that success of his country that the world would see, compared to the failures that his people would be afraid of pointing out. One of the more legitimate criticisms of the ego and how it's tied to political behavior comes down to Sigmund Freud. Um, a lot of his conclusions were based on personal conclusions um, and even personal con convictions at times. And it was, said, it was often said that there was no systematic presentation, either quantitative or qualitative, of Freud's empirical findings. And the problem with that is psychological research and any research done really needs to be defined in a way that allows for empirical testing to be done so that further elaboration to studies can be possible. And in the case of international relations, Changing circumstances require constant adjustments to allow us to make conclusions on human behavior. And if we don't have that information provided to us through psychoanalysis, he, individual behavior and motivations become quite, un, quite unclear. But nevertheless, the ego is still a very important um, component to understanding leaders and their decisions during war, as it allows us to see the consequences of an ego that overshadows the majority um, or fails to um, recognize humanity. And now I'll move to the psychological tactics of warfare. So psychological warfare is defined as the systematic process of influencing the will and so directing the actions of people and enemy and enemy occupied territories according to the needs of higher strategy. And I'd like to emphasize the underlined um, portion on your screen because psychological tactics of warfare aren't the be all end all of war operations. When taken as a whole, psychological warfare does not win or lose wars alone. It is a support weapon that assists military operations and takes a, st a state's policy objectives to another dimension um, during these tense psychological standoffs between two or more um, armies. In both of the wars that I discussed, propaganda serves as an important element to the psychological operations that take place but particularly pr propaganda through political oratory in the media and the Yugoslav wars had a profound impact on the emotional texture of war. When you think of these particular tactics, they all in a way reinforce each other. For example, the rhetoric used by Milicevic was key in deprogramming already reluctant and righteous attitudes 
that, and it, and it was sort of seen in a way that challenged um, people's moral, moral values so that they could be immersed into um, the mythical realities created during war. Then all of this was upheld by the media. It was frequently said that in the former Yugoslavia that all victims died twice, first on television and then a reality. And a lot, of the, a lot of this showed us how much the media was meant to attack the bases of emotion. So understanding a war like the Vietnam War, that requires high-level intelligence and analysis of the so-called human terrain, or the cultural factors that are necessary to determine the most effective operations. And if this step fails to succeed, or if this step fails to be executed properly, the whole operation, or sorry, the whole psychological operation often fails to provide a successful end. Contrary to common belief, a lot of the, contrary to common belief, winning over the hearts and minds of people in Vietnam would not work, as they had worked in other parts in Asia during other wars. What we see as a result of this is that, um, is the creation and the use of word, wordless leaflets, as many Westerners struggle to communicate with and thus gain the allegiance of the Vietnamese. The problem with these leaflets was that they were not pretested for their efficacy in mobilizing groups against um, enemy troops. The fundamental question these leaflets should have tested were how might the intended message be interpreted and, in, and how might it result in a shifting of allegiances away from the South Vietnamese government. And really change had to be a measurable parameter that, either, um, that resulted in either growing support for the South Vietnamese government um, and or dwindling influence of the Viet Cong all of which did not happen and contributed to a series of drawbacks for the West while the Viet Cong enjoyed propaganda development acquired from foreign presence. So there is no single great obstacle to world, world peace. The ambivalence of world, world peace details a concept as an absence of a state of war. And while this understanding is prevalent during our daily lives, it is the international community that often determines peace as when one surrenders to another, leading to a warless but ravaged environment. In other words, victory after peace very rarely turns, turns two enemies into close companions because of peace, nor does tra destruction transform itself through the attainment of peace. In both situations, peace requires an ambitious agenda that attends not only to tr traditional concerns but about the nonviolent resolution of conflict, but also to growing concerns about the pursuit of socially just ends. And once again, we see the importance of knowing the difference between the difference between revenge and justice, because justice allows for success when pursuing socially just ends and helps individuals gain some sort of closure um, through the attainment of peace. As the Vietnam War came to an end, it was quite obvious that, the North Vietnam, that North Vietnam would possess greater authority in establishing favorable institutions and enforcing what, are sort, what is sort of known as the rules of the game. To resettle two groups separated along ideological lines, although of the same ethnicity, a lot of that introduced fears of polarizing politics and leader-led oppression. This leads us to how integration strategies would ease situations like those in Vietnam. And the most important and initial step of this process would be addressing perceptions of gr group superiority and group inferiority. So contact hypothesis influences both group inferiority and group superiority as it encourages increased intergroup contact. But this only works in an environment where there is great institutional support that emphasizes equality, but even more so emphasizes equity in representative levels of government. And ultim ultimately, the psychological underpinnings of power sharing and power dividing um, throughout these efforts can be traced to an individual's willingness to compromise and ability to trust, which can be difficult, of course, um, and invo can involve various levels of vulnerability. During the time of U Yugoslavia's dissolution, it was known that the roles of the UN were limited to begin with, considering that they lacked the resources and the personnel to assist in efforts. What we see is that the temporary answer to all politically driven violence came in the form of urging ceasefires, um, while diplomats engaged in on-the-ground mediation efforts. However, organizations like the UN were, whose internationally recognized purpose was to aid in security and uh, peace efforts, a lot, of the, a lot of them inflicted further psychological damage on suffering individuals. It was said that, a, that the wars created a new elite foreign class and that in country after country we see these patterns that um, we see patterns as peacekeepers seek these lavish lifestyles and vacation destinations um, in during war and during peace efforts 
What develops as a result of these realities are Orientalist ways of thinking and neocolonial complexes um, that only further obstruct peace efforts. And I say this because as Westerners, we view peace linearly because of how gradational affairs such as bringing UN peacekeepers in um, into a conflict zone, how a lot of those stuff are conducted. And the, and the domineering approach of codifying peace and, through agreements and providing therapeutics without um, actually researching the existing cultural sensitivities in a particular region, region is really what I believe as the main um, issue in the peacemaking and peacebuilding processes in wars um, like those in Yugoslavia. And once again, we are back to nationalism, but this time wondering if nationalism can produce world peace. I think that I've made it rather very clear, at least I hope so, that um, nationalism is not inherently violent, but it engenders environments conducive to interstate and international conflict bounding intergenerational civilizations. In this respect, nationalism can drive individuals towards conflict and violent means, but once again, it is not inherently violent. Um, because a nationalistic individual isn't just willing to, sim to, uh, to physically attack an individual outside of his or her nation simply because of their nationalistic drive. Since the formation of nation states in 1648, systems of governance have relied on um, nationalist fervor to measure legitimacy during war. The foundation for this influence rarely succeeds without war's ability to bring people together, um, obviously along with propaganda and um, the political oratory of leaders. Now what makes this interesting is that peaceful resolution to war is driven by the very content of this nationalist drive. Um, for me, I found, it very, I found it very interesting and also ironic to discern the importance of war and peace to both na to nationalist fervor because war thrived off of nationalist values whereas peace and nationalism struggled to get on the same wavelength. When militarism accompanies nationalism, it's quite difficult to anticipate peace between parties, rendering, the, rendering nationalism an outlet that threatens even the lesser desir desirable classific classification of peace, um, also known as, known as negative peace. And one quote that really ties into this and that um, I was reminded by um, nationalism through reading it was a quote by Karl von Clausewitz. Um, and he reminds us that action can never be based on anything firmer than instinct. And what I've gained from this is that if one chooses to embark on instinctive nationalist strategies as a means to exemplify his or her superiority over um, another group following war, it, it is fitting then to assert that nationalism very rarely results in peaceful societies and, results, and rather results in um, diplomatic relations lacking the understanding and mutual respect for um, cultures. There is so much to political psychology, and I hope that I've made clear that psychology isn't meant to heal or cure the brain, or even the malfunctioning of human behavior. Rather, it provides practitioners of any field the, the outlet to employ resources throughout destabilizing events to help maintain some sort of normalcy. I'd like to leave you all with what I call psychological remedies and what we could all do to curb the dangerous roots of conflict and war, along with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. And I think it perfectly puts into perspective the world today and the decisions some leaders have made that uninvolved individuals tragically have to deal with. And that concludes um, my presentation. I'd like to take some questions. Yeah, absolutely. I think social psychology stood out to me the most. Um, I think because diplomacy and war and throughout peace efforts were surrounded by individuals constantly, and um, it's really interesting to see how individuals can um, influence our decisions. Um, so I'd have to say social psychology, but psychology in general has been very intriguing to me. Um, when I was thinking of a subject to, um, or a topic to write on for my article, I wanted to apply psychology to something, whether it be nationalism, terrorism, genocide, and I ultimately, ultimately came to the decision of talking about war and peace because I think that it involves all aspects of, um, social, all subfields of psych psychology, but also it involves nationalism, terrorism, um, and even genocide in some wars. Yeah. 
Okay, and now I'd like to introduce my classmate, Gabriela Violet, who will speak on the repatriation of stolen artwork. I'd like to thank Hayat, who has been a fellow editor on the Globus Mundi team and who supported me throughout writing this paper and forming this presentation. I'd like to thank my professors, especially Professor Morales, because this is an incredible opportunity that isn't normally offered to students at our level and is generally reserved for people at a graduate level. And I think it's fantastic that we have the opportunity to explore things like this right now. Moving on to my presentation. So my presentation is covering the repatriation of stolen artifacts. Specifically, I will be discussing the repatriation of artifacts from Sub-Saharan Africa by the European nations that previously colonized the region. I'm focusing on this because I see repatriation in this sense as a step in decolonization, which I believe has not quite ended. Uh, my discussion is predicated on the acceptance of two facts. One, that cultural artifacts are an important part of a people's heritage, and that being deprived of that heritage stunts not, <laughs> that being deprived of their heritage prevents them from going further. Throughout my presentation, I will be going through multiple stages. I'm going to start with giving an incomplete inventory of artifacts from Sub-Saharan Africa, which are no longer on the continent. And then I'm going to move on to the consequences of that loss of heritage. Then I'm going to examine the situation through multiple case studies, the first being Germany, the next being France, and following that, the United Kingdom. Then I'm going to cover the historical precedents of repatriation between different European nations. And finally, I'm going to end with a possible frame for, framework for change based on the UN DRIP and the Faro Convention. My presentation requires some parameters to be set. First, I'm only going to be discussing artifacts that are held within public institutions, specifically national museums. I'm doing this for two reasons. For one, it is incredibly difficult to determine exactly how many artifacts and which artifacts are held in private collections. One, because they're not required to do inventories of those artifacts, and two, because they are not required to disclose them to the public. Secondarily, I believe that there is a distinct power imbalance that is established when one nation is allowed to hold the cultural heritage of another hostage. So, giving a complete inventory of the artifacts from Sub-Saharan Africa, which are held in Europe and around the world, is a nearly impossible task. One of those being the huge number of artifacts which are no longer held on the continent. According to the Sar Savoy Report, commissioned in 2018 by President Emmanuel Macron, only between 10 and 20% of Sub-Saharan Africa's cultural heritage remains on the continent. The remaining 80 to 90% exists in a state of limbo in museums and private collections in Europe and around the world. There are several obstacles in creating a comprehensive list of the artifacts which are no longer on the continent, as I explained sh due to the sheer number of them. Another is the number of artifacts that are held in regional museums and university collections. These museums are notoriously underfunded and they often don't have the number of curators needed to keep close eye on their artifacts. So there's a lot of losing of artifacts, there's a lot of misplacing of them, and in that uh, changeover, there's a lot of damage incurred. A good example of the artifacts that I will be looking at is the Benin bronzes, simply because of the large number of them. But as an example of just how many artifacts I'm talking about, in three museums alone, in the British Museum there are 60,000 artifacts from Sub-Saharan Africa. In the, Muse in the Musée de Quibronli Museum in France, there are 70,000 artifacts. And in the Humble Forum in Germany, there are 75,000 artifacts. As I'm focusing on the Banyan bronzes in this discussion, I'd like to give a piece of history on it. To begin with, the collection is not made entirely of bronzes, despite what the name is. It consists of statues, carved ivory, body ornaments, and the bronzes, the most famous of those being the bronze plaques, which are currently held in the British Museum. Some of these artifacts are royal, some of them were used ritually, and some of them are sacred 
In 1897, a small British trading expedition was in danger of interrupting royal rituals in Benin. To prevent this, to prevent this a group of chiefs without the Oba's permission, which is their sovereign, went out to confront them. In this confrontation, the small trading expedition was killed. This led to a second punitive expedition in which British forces set out to capture Benin. They led a scorched earth campaign during which they, build, they burned villages and fields along their way to the capital. Once they got to the capital, they looted the palace, taking all of the royal artifacts, and then they burned it to the ground. All the royal treasures that were stolen from this were then sold in auction to pay for the cost of this expedition. There are several natural consequences that come with the looting of artifacts. The first is a perversion of the original intent of these artifacts. It takes the art, the religious artifacts, and even the remains of the dead and turns them from what would have been symbols of pride into symbols of their own subjugation. Not only are a people deprived of their precious cultural heritage, but they are forced to see that heritage displayed in the halls of their oppressors, where it becomes a permanent re reminder of the power imbalance that exists. Westerners saw this art and these artifacts and compared them to Western art at the time. And upon noting the difference, used it as a basis that the African people were primitive and that they were therefore lesser and that any action taken against them should not be seen as a serious. Additionally, there's a glorification that comes with displaying objects looted during colonial violence. It brings material gain and becomes a material evidence of the power imbalance that exists. Artifacts are tangible pieces of history and they do not and cannot exist outside of that. Displaying them, displaying war trophies, glorifies the violence and the violent means by which they were taken and the people who did the taking. Beyond that, there's an objectification of the human remains which are taken. The human remains, they're taken and they're stripped of their identities. They're taken from their homes and from their families. They lose their, they lose their names. And those names are instead replaced with ID numbers. The skulls were taken, they were measured. And those measurements were compared to European skulls. Any differences that were noted were used as evidence that not only were the, was the African culture inferior, but the people were as well. It dehumanized them, and it allowed, it allowed for an easier, a way to more easily destroy the African people. When arguing for repatriation, there are several arguments that pop up in opposition to it. The first being that Europe can provide better conditions for these artifacts, and that so they should not be removed. This is problematic on a multitude of levels. The first being the level of care that they receive in the museums that they are at currently. The British Museum and the Humboldt Forum especially are notorious for the poor conditions that the artifacts are kept in. Looking at the British Museum, the Parthenon sculptures present a good example. In the, fir the first time that they were allowed to be examined by non-British Museum staff, it was noted that there was severe and irreparable damage that had been incurred during cleaning in the 1930s. Additionally, there is flooding and water damage to that and other exhibits because of the leaking roof that they do not have the funds to repair. The Humboldt Forum on its part has problems with flooding and frost damage, insect activity, and general mismanagement, including contaminations by harmful chemicals. Looking beyond the actual state of things, there's an implication that comes with this. It implies that Africa is incapable of looking after its own interests, that they need European guidance and stewardship, which is a direct carryover of colonialist thought. Added to this, the fact that Nigeria is building a new Royal Benin Museum that could house these artifacts. It is at the same, if not a better level, than the artifacts that they are currently held in, and is the work of the Benin Dialogue Group, which I will be discussing shortly. There's in addition to the short-term consequences, there are long-term impacts that come to a people and to their culture when they are deprived of the physical representations of this. There's a loss of context that comes. 
Artifacts are a direct line to a people's history. They're cultural touchstones, and taking them away severs that connection that a people could have to their past. A Nigerian artist, upon visiting the British Museum and seeing the Benin bronzes hung up, compared them to laundry on a line and remarked how painful it was for him to see them in the state that they were and noted that this is no, in no way similar to how they would have been displayed if they were in Benin on the altars and the shrines that they'd previously been on. By not being there, by being displayed, as he said, laundry on their lines, they lose a good deal of the power that they once held. There's a cultural disconnect that also happens. And for a way to look at this, I'm going to be referring to a term sankofa, which comes from the Akan ethno-linguistic group in Ghana. The word sankofa means to go back. It's part of a larger proverb that translates, it is not wrong to return for what has been forgotten. The philosophy stems from the idea that a people should be able to learn from their past and allow that learning and that knowledge to guide them in the future. They need access to their history to make those decisions. Additionally, this becomes a constant reminder of the history of this imbalance of power in which Africans are made to travel to Europe and pay for the right to access their own history. The Benin Dialogue Group is a group which is trying to change this. They were, they were established in 2007 and are made up of a collection of European museums and Nigerian agencies. The central group, group uh, goal of this group is to establish a museum in Nigeria to house the artifacts belonging to Benin and to open lines of communication for a conversation on repatriation. I'm next gonna be moving on to my case studies, starting with Germany. In 2015, a tour of colonial history was held in which Germany invited representatives from their former colonial empire, including rep representatives from Namibia, Cameroon, Ghana, Togo, and Tanzania, to facilitate a conversation on how Germany should approach their colonialist past and how they should move forward. In 2019, this marked the centennial anniversary of the Treaty of Versailles that ended the German colonial empire and this inspired multiple conversations. One of them was on the repatriation of artifacts and whether and how it should proceed. It also led to a discussion of the Namibian genocide, which occurred between 1904 and 1908. This genocide led to the death of tens of thousands of Namibian people. It resulted in the deaths of over 40% of the Nama people and over 80% of the Ova Herero people. Their bodies were taken. These are some of the remains that were taken to Germany. Victims of genocide were put on display. Their bodies were mocked. They were used as an excuse for the violence that had been perpetrated against them. In 2021, Germany, in responding to the conversations that had been held prior to this, became the first nation to facilitate a mass repatriation of artifacts. They pledged to return hundreds of artifacts to Nigeria because of what they called a moral responsibility. This was the result of work with the Benin Dialogue Group, of which three German museums are members. Repatriation is supposed to begin this year, in 2022, and last year, in October, Germany confirmed that they were on track to begin these repatriations. Next, I'm going to look at France and how they have dealt with this. In 2019, President Macron traveled to Africa and in a speech at a university in Burkina Faso, he became the first French president not only to acknowledge France's colonial past, but to explicitly condemn it. In the speech, he pledged to make repatriation a priority under his administration, and he gave himself a five-year deadline in which time he wanted to establish conditions for a process of temporary or permanent returns of artifacts it should be noted that this deadline has since passed, and in the lead up to his campaign for re-election, the discussion of repatriation ceased entirely as he tried to court conservative votes. In 2018, he commissioned the Sar Savoy Report, which I referenced earlier, which gave an examination of the state of, Europe of African artifacts in European museums and argued for a mass repatriation. In 2021, a individual bill was passed which allowed for the return of the Abome treasures. 
Because the way the French legal system is set up, any returns require individual bills to be passed by the parliament. The French legislature passed a bill returning these, a collection of 27 artifacts. But in doing so, they made it clear that this was a individual instance, and it was not meant to be a statement on a general right to repatriation. This is seen in the fact that a part of the bill was removed, a part which would have established a more permanent system for dealing with claims for repatriation. My next example is the United Kingdom. In 2014, the British Museum was meant to hold a meeting hosting the Benin Dialogue Group. They neglected to do so. That fourth meeting that they were supposed to hold was not held until 2017, when the University of Cambridge decided to take it upon themselves to do so. In 2021, the Church of England decided to repatriate, artifact, to repatriate two Benin bronzes, which had been given to the Archbishop of Canterbury over 50 years ago. The University of Aberdeen in Scotland returned their Banyan bronze, and the Cambridge University's Jesus College returned their Banyan bronze, which had not been on display for several years in response to student protests. This is the artifact pictured here. I would like to note that there has been no action and no comment by the national government. Any action that has been taken has been undertaken by individual institutions. Looking at a history of returns between European nations, we start with the Congress of Vienna, in which the four great powers, Austria, the United Kingdom, Russia, and Prussia met to discuss what should be done in the, in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. Part of this discussion concerned the repatriation of artifacts that had been taken by France. Next, we move on to the Conference of Brussels that occurred in 1874. It was called by Russia and it was an attempt to establish international laws on the conduct of war, what was acceptable and what should be condemned. It was not legally binding, but it shows the opinions at the time and formed the basis for the first Hague Convention, which occurred later. Importantly, it discussed the legal obligation of a people not to loot and to see the return of any looted items. Moving on to the Hague Convention, it was originally meant to place restrictions on armaments, but it quickly evolved into something far greater than that. Importantly, it established that the rules that followed would apply not only to national armies in times of war, but to any group under the command of a superior officer who carried weapons and were identifiable from a distance by uniform or other distinguishing characteristics. I would like to point out that this would then apply to the British troops who raided Benin. Article 1 is the one which establishes that these rules of conduct apply outside of war. Article 46 and 47 establish that private property must not be confiscated and that pillaging is to be condemned. Article 56 in this establishes that the property of institutes of art and science, of religious institutions, and state property are also to be considered, state pro or to be considered private property and thus subject to the same protections. Lastly, I'd like to address the Treaty of Versailles which compelled Germany to return any stolen artifacts stolen during World War II and during the Franco-Prussian War, in addition to the many other things it sought to do. There is a clear acknowledgement of the importance of cultural artifacts in this, and timely returns, as the returns were meant to be done within a five-year period. Moving on to how we may proceed in the future, I'd like to start with the UN DRIP, which was pass, which was, um, sorry, adopted by the Human Rights Council in 2006 and by the General Assembly in 2007. It is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It establishes that the rights of indigenous people, specifically the right to the protection of their heritage, and that the transfer of cultural objects during foreign occupation is prohibited, and any unlawfully obtained objects should be exported. It also establishes the right of self-determination for indigenous people. And within that, they are given the right to pursue their social and cultural development. Additionally, states shall seek to enable the access and repatriation of cultural uh, objects, and that states should take appropriate, including legislative measures, to ensure that this occurs. While it is not strictly legally binding, I would like to point out that declarations by the UN are considered to be of the utmost importance 
and significance, and there is an expectation that all member nations will comply with them. Moving on to the Faro Convention, which occurred in 2005 and was a meeting of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe where they adopted the Framework Convention on the Value of Cultural Heritage for a Society. It had the goal of establishing the importance of cultural heritage and provided a framework for protecting that heritage and how it should be done. It established for its part that everyone has the right to benefit from their cultural heritage and that states are obligated to ensure legislative provisions exist to exercise the right to cultural heritage. It also establishes that states are obligated to establish processes to deal with competing claims on cultural heritage items, which is in essence what claims for, calls for repatriation are. In conclusion, I'd like to point out that my presentation is a conversation about repatriation and repatriation at its core is a conversation about decolonization. An open and honest conversation on decolonization and repatriation begins with addressing the reason why it needs to occur in the first place. European museums would like to see themselves as unbiased and impartial conveyors of history, but they are deeply involved in this. They were the original depositories for these looted items during the colonial era, and they were the mouthpieces for pro-colonialist thought. The archaeologists and anthropologists that work there now are the successors to that legacy. The leaders of the European nations now who not, are the successors to the people who not two centuries ago were ravaging Africa. One may not condemn their past while clinging to it. And that is what Europe is doing in refusing to repatriate artifacts. They cannot claim to have decolonized Africa while they are still benefiting from the legacy of that colonialism. Europe seems to see repatriation as an admission of guilt and an acknowledgement of wrongdoing. But in not saying or doing anything, it is as much an admission that they intend to continue down this path. All right, thank you everyone. That concludes my actual presentation. So I would now like to open the floor to, to questions, beginning with staff. I have one for you. First of all, let me thank you for your excellent presentation because you contextualize it and really uh, stress the humanity and the, and the suffering of colonialism and the legacy, the ugly legacy of colonialism and imperialism. So uh, big props to you for that. Thank you very much. Secondly, I, w I was wondering if you have any uh, any plans of, of maybe even looking into this further in Latin America and the rep repatriation of of uh, artifacts that are in Europe that belong to indigenous people in, of Latin America. I would very much like to. Perhaps that'll be my paper for next, uh, for next year. Uh, I specifically decided to focus on Africa for my paper simply because of the number of artifacts, because when I read the Sarsavoy report and read that they had lost over 80% of their cultural heritage, that spoke to me very deeply. But I'd like to continue this conversation and continue researching this wherever it applies. In Latin America, it certainly does. Of course. Is there anyone else who would like to ask me a question? Yes. Um, how, great presentation. How, um, how do you think nationalism and things of that nature of authoritarian play into the denial of um, repatriation, the prevention of those acts, and the privation of a national identity of strength? Well, that isn't exactly what I covered in my, presen uh, in my presentation or in my research. I. Uh, I don't know how much authoritarian, authoritarianism specifically relates to this, but yes, of course, a you know, strong nationalist fervor and a desire to portray yourself as, as strong certainly would prevent a repatriation of artifacts if you see that as a weakness or an admission of wrongdoing. All right, thank you. I would like to welcome Professor Morales back up so he can discuss other things. As our two presenters have thanked us for affording them this opportunity, let me just repeat that this is really an exercise that is a graduate level exercise. This is what you get to do when you are presenting and defending your, your graduate thesis or if you're going on to 
uh, doctoral work, this is what we call orals. This is where you stand and defend your, your research and your ideas. And I think it's valuable to introduce it at this level because there's no, there's no reason why students at this level should not be afforded the opportunity. Um, if nothing else, consider it as practice for what's coming down the road. And I think it's incumbent on the universities to accept that this is something that, even at our level, the community college level, is something that we're working for uh, our students to be able to, to enjoy. So we're very pleased to be able to offer this opportunity. Um, I think it's, it's an incredible exercise, and you've seen the, the tremendous amount of work that goes into these uh, in the form of journal articles, the research, the writing, the editing, um, the redrafting, the, re, the rewriting in some instances, and then the rehearsals for, for, these, um, for these colloquia. So uh, again, this is just an opportunity for our students that we're very pleased to be able to, to provide. Speaking of writing, next year's, or I would say this year's journal, volume 12, um, is full of amazing articles. Uh, our alum, Miles McAnulty, who is in uh, Arizona, is writing about space. You've seen Hayat and Gabriela's presentations. Jimmy, the guy over there by the door, uh, did an amazing, probably the best presentation I've ever had in, in an IR class on the UN. And from that, he provides us an article on the veto paradox in the UN. Um, Mike Berna, who uh, is producing an article on French foreign policy under Macron. Um, Isabella is, Isabella Zaragoza is writing an article on Ethiopia being at uh, war with itself. Uh, Paula Lee is producing an article on Jianjing from jihadism to terrorism. Uh, Sophia Fields, who is also, um, who, who's leaving us as well, we'll talk about in a second, uh, took her work in an honors course on political rhetoric to produce this wonderful article on uh, Russian propaganda about the United, I'm sorry, about uh, Ukraine from the United States perspective. Jesse White produces one on the article of democracy, I'm sorry, the arsenal of democracy. Uh, Omar Ali, who is very interested in money, uh, wrote an article on cash currency and crypto. Thank you, Omar. And for the first time in a long time, we have a joint publication, I'm sorry, a joint article written by two students, uh, Madison Hinshaw and Alicia Robbins, on the third estate and their grievances during the, the French Revolution. And interestingly enough, this article uh, sort of came out of nowhere. They produced abstracts in revolutions and ideologies for their research papers. And I don't think they knew each other, but I looked at the abstracts and I said, do you two know each other? Um, this, is, this is a great idea for a paper. If you like each other, feel comfortable working with each other, um, go ahead and give it a try. And we're pleased to include it in our, um, in our 12th edition of, of our uh, journal. Um, I'd like to thank the editors for this journal. It's been very difficult, I'm not going to lie, it's been very difficult having to put this together uh, over the course of the last year when we first met as online sections. And it's really hard to tell who's, um, who's going to rise to the level to not only write but to, to participate in the editing process. Um, Hayat and uh, Gabriela and Isabella, where, where are you Isabella? Um, the work that you've done on the journal has been phenomenal, so thank you very, very much for, for your contributions in producing uh, this journal. Here are the covers for our journal. The first one is called Child Soldier, and the second one is a photograph entitled Surveillance. These are by our student Paula Lee. And yeah, there you are. Uh, Paula's artwork, it, it's always funny, you ask, does anybody paint? Does anybody do any art, anything artistic? You know, do we, do, you know, do we, where do we get our artwork? And when she sent me these exemplars, I'm like, oh my God, these are perfect um, for, uh, for our journal. So thank you very, very much. I'm sure that uh, CRC graphics folks are gonna have fun trying to mask uh, child soldier with everything that needs to go on a cover, but um, um, they'll figure it out, they, they always do. This is the best part of the evening as far as we're concerned in that we get to showcase what we do. Our department produces 12 to 13 percent of CRC's total UC transfer. Just us. And I take great pride in the fact that we are able to pull this off. Omer going to uh, UC Davis. Miriam, who is not enrolled in any political science courses this semester, has been accepted at UC Berkeley. Michael is leaving us for UC Davis. 
Sophia Fields, who is also an honors program student, is transferring to Santa Barbara. Jimmy, uh, probably the biggest surprise from COVID year ever, and certainly someone I've enjoyed having as a student is going to University of the Pacific. Rosa Peshkov is going to Santa Barbara. Nicole Sarabia, who is the other person running around with a camera, is going to be attending Fordham University. And she's also a CRC student athlete uh, playing on our, our women's softball team. And Jesse White is going to UC Davis. Let's tell me about Jesse. When we got shut down for COVID, Jesse was the last person I saw, literally. As I'm trying to leave the building, Jesse's wandering down the hall. Professor, I'm like, I gotta go, man. Uh, we're being kicked out of here. And uh, when we came back this semester with masks on, I looked at him, he looked at me, I'm like, yeah, you look the same. Um, but um, Jesse will always be that, that memory to me. And um, it's funny how now I get to see your name on, on the screen as, as a transfer um, student. And granted, it's a small class, but we're just coming back, and I think that's the most important thing. Um, we're looking forward to having this be at least twice as long next year when we do this. Next year will be our, our 10th uh, annual colloquium. We should probably try to find a nice venue for it, um, maybe the, the art gallery or something. And if, if, it's such, if that is the case, then obviously you, you will be presenting on Latin American art and repatriation, <laughs> whether you want to or not. Nice suggestion, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, these are our uh, transfers, and I just want to you know, just give you all a round of applause for the tremendous amount of work and dedication you put in. <laughs> Some announcements about next year. Uh, it's very fitting that you presented on, and on uh, your topic on Africa because our Global Studies course next semester will be on Africa. I'll be teaching international relations and Beth will be teaching uh, in political theory. In the spring semester, in other words, a year from now, uh, Beth will be teaching a section on um, US government and honor section. We will have our second offering of statistics. This was the first year that we offered our own statistics course. And the spring semester global studies course will be on Central Asia. And again, that's an interesting part of the world that gets very little attention. We're very pleased to have that. Uh, as part of our course offerings. I will say that for international relations, we will be spending an inordinate amount of time analyzing the war crimes being committed uh, by Russia in Ukraine. Uh, the tragedy of, of where we are is that there is no focused course on uh, international law, but we will definitely be devoting time to it because it is something that cannot just be swept aside or you know, assigned as additional reading. It's something that must be, that must be addressed. Um, I've, I've published this the last two years in, in Globus Mundi as, as events when we go back and then we don't come back and then when we go back we haven't been back well next year assuming that we're back uh, we will be reshooting our orientation video for um, for our students there'll be two films offered throughout the course of the year each one promotes the offerings for the next semester for our global studies courses um, in case you're unaware of things there's a midterm election coming up in November we will be definitely talking about that and hopefully we'll get together and, and celebrate the, the holidays. We'll come back from that and talk about the State of the Union. Um, we will also publish the next edition of Globus Fundi. We'll have our 10th annual colloquium, and hopefully we will be able to go somewhere and grill something somewhere and just enjoy um, our company for the last time before everybody from next year's class transfers off. Um, I'm very pleased. Uh, I didn't think it'd be possible coming back from COVID and from being online, but I'm very pleased that we've actually been able to, to build a nice cohort. Yes, it's small, but that doesn't matter. It's a good cohort. There's esprit de corps. There's respect. There's collaboration, which I think is key. Uh, I'm telling all of those people whose names you saw on the slides that when they transfer and today in, in, in uh, comparative politics specifically that enjoy this while you can because next year while you're at another university at the UC, you're not gonna have this degree of cooperation. It's actually competitive. And you know the words trust no one take on a whole new meaning. <laughs> you will all rely on each other the way that our alumni have. On the issue of alumni, I wanna acknowledge my former teaching assistant back there, Eamon, get off the floor, man, um, <laughs> who was um, running around with a camera. And um, his cohort is now graduating from UC Berkeley. I'm great, I've been graciously invited by, by Eamon and his family to, to attend his graduation. In addition to that, there's at least three or four other people from his class that are, that are graduating at the same time. Uh, 
Um, but back to the point, those of you who, who remain, the idea that you're here for another year, that you have friends that you know that are going to be your collaborators, I think is something that should give you comfort. So on that happy note, I am going to thank you all for coming and hope to see you next year. Um, thank you so much for coming to support Gabriella, and hopefully you come next year when she does this, this paper that Professor Peshkov has, has proposed for her. Um, and quite honestly, you know, I, I've said this many times, look at the school's website, even if, if she's not here or when she's gone, uh, those of you who are leaving as well, you know, we have events year round. You don't need an invitation. Just look at the website, look at the calendar, and please feel free to, to come by. Um, it's always nice to see, to see alumni. So thank you all very much for coming, particularly faculty and family, and have a, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. you.